morning. How are you? I will um, start with one of my stories. This world famous photographer was having dinner at a penthouse in New York City with a very famous woman who he had met on an assignment. And she said, my, your photos are stunning. What kind of camera do you have? And he said, this dinner was wonderful. What kind of stove do you use? It has nothing to do with the stove, the camera. It has to do with your head. Everything is about what do you see, what do you think, what do you feel, what does the viewer need to see. And it doesn't matter if it's a video camera, a movie camera, a cell phone video, a digital SLR camera, a point and shoot. It's all of those make great photographs, but the only reason they do is because someone is thinking and paying attention and understanding the light and seeing and has an idea. A great photos don't just, good photos don't just happen. You've got to think about it a little bit. There's sure there's the lucky stuff, but for the most part, you, you have to be paying attention and you have to understand your equipment and so that you can devote all your time to what's going on in front of me and what am I trying to capture? What am I trying to see? Um, photography should, strong images should evoke an emotion, uh, make you happy, make you sad, make you smarter, make you question things, attract your attention. Uh, social media now is the outlet for images and people are posting photos on Facebook thousands every second all over the world. And those, you can reach people so much faster today than, than you could five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, but the run of the mill photos are the ones you glance at and you move right on. The great pictures are the ones that you stop and stare at. And you need to, photographs have to be well composed, interesting, that you freeze on it for just long enough and you want to go look at the caption, you want to pay attention to it. And that's the, that's the same whether, you, again, you're doing videos, stills, whatever. How many in here shoot still photos? And how many do video things? Okay, so you're, you're familiar with both. How many of you use a camera that has a zoom lens or interchangeable lenses? Okay. This is different than last night. I'm not going to talk about some of the things then that I possibly would have because you get it or I think you've got a much better handle on it. Um, back up quickly. At one time, the Dayton Daily News employed 14 photographers, uh, and I managed a staff of 14, which then a couple people left. We had 12, then a couple people retired, and we had 10. And then as the newspaper industry changed, revenues dropped, Circulation dropped, things needed to change, and in 2006, near the end of 2006, they offered retirement packages to employees who were particularly long-term employees. I was one of those, but our photo staff of 10 went to six in one day because four of us all retired the same day. There were 17 employees walked out that day and, you know, moved on to other things. Now, since then, I still freelance. I still do work for the Associated Press, the University of Dayton. Premier Health Group, um, the Marianists publish a magazine. They're the religious order that runs the University of Dayton. I do some work for them. Uh, so I stay busy maybe three, four days a month. Uh, sometimes it's 10 days a month, and some days I go months where I don't work at all. Uh, but it's, it's a kind of a nice gig, but I keep my hand in things, uh, so I'm not a dinosaur completely. The, but the newspaper industry has changed dramatically over the years. Um, we shot film, black and white, when I started in 1973. Morphed over to shooting all color in sometime in the mid-80s when we could print color all the time. And in the early 90s is when the first digital cameras came out. The first digital camera that was actually ever practical used a gigantic recorder, which was a giant hard drive and, and a magnetic tape to record the picture on and you could take three pictures on one giant VHS tape. And obviously you can see how it's changed now. You can take it, get a 64 gigabyte card to stick in a camera. Uh, our first computers didn't have one gigabyte of memory in them. Uh, we started messing around with digital cameras in 1992 or 93. We bought our first one in 95, and I kind of played with that off and on. Um, it was $35,000 for the camera. Today, 
a digital SLR is somewhere between $800 for a really low end one up to maybe five grand for the Canon EOS 1D. Uh, but in 1998, we switched to all digital. And at that point, I was still thinking, oh, you know what? There'll always be film. Well, I haven't shot a roll of film since October of 1998. I have no reason to. The quality, the ability to, to edit, the ability to transmit, to share, to... We used to pack up a darkroom and haul it out when we went on a story or we had to go travel on the road. We, we packed 200 pounds of equipment in cases and set up darkrooms in the bathroom of hotels and processed film and made prints. And now it's a camera bag full of stuff and a laptop computer, and bingo, we're done. I can send a photo from anywhere in seconds. Um, so that's a little bit of background on the news business. Um, my real theory or my real feeling, though, that I, I kind of want to get across to all of you is, is it's more about your brain engaging in what you want to do and how you're going to attract the reader or the viewer by the content of your image. And again, this applies to video and stills. You want them to pay attention to your message. You've been sent out to cover something, to report something, to create a package on something. It's got to flow. It's got to attract attention. It's got to hold attention. It's got to communicate. It needs to be objective. If you're, in the, if you're doing a feature, the objectivity aspect of it, I think, changes a little bit. But if you're reporting news, covering a sporting event, doing a documentary on, on the campus here at school, you need to say, what do people need to see? What do I need to show them? Are there other sides of this story? You need to go into a situation and realize life is not all about walking around at eye level. Look for different angles of view to attract the attention. Eye level is pretty normal for all of us. But does the camera need to be at a low angle looking up? Should it be up on a high angle looking down? Is paying attention to the light, is it working for me or working against me? Is it dramatic or is it just dull? My one theory is between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. is the worst time of day to ever take pictures outside. It's just a giant fluorescent light going down on you. There's no contrast. Your eyes are in, the, in shadows. It's boring. Sunrise to 10 a.m., 2 o'clock in the afternoon till dusk. That's the prime time. That's when the light is more interesting. Now, you can't do everything like that. But if, if you have con control over the situation, make the light work for you. Again, it adds depth, it makes the reader pay attention, it makes the viewer look at it. Um, it gives drama, it gives uh, you know, composition to the image. Uh, and questions, by the way, as you have them, literally pulled up your hand. I don't want you to not you know, forget the question 30 seconds later. So uh, let's, do you have anything on your mind right now? Not a one. All right. Um, computer enhancement manipulation is, is something that in journalism, we do none of it. We crop, we color correct, remove any dust specks that if you have a dirty sensor and you have boogers on your images, you can clean those up. Other than that, we don't change the content at all. If there's a tree growing out of somebody's head and against a blue sky, we don't clone the tree out. It stays there. You've made the mistake. You need to move. Look at your image and change your angle of view. So uh, if you're doing an illustration, you're creating something for a marketing program or an ad or something like that, feel free to do anything you want. You're not passing off this image as a document. You're creating an illustration. But if you're covering something, you don't get to manipulate it. And uh, social media is because of the amount of manipulation on images and taking photos and putting text on them and all these other things that go on in social media today, I am concerned that the ethics of that is um, less enforced. People think it's okay to do whatever they want to do. I think this it looks better this way. It's funnier this way. That doesn't cut it. Uh, and that's where the objectivity of communication is just because it's on Facebook just because it's on Instagram doesn't me necessarily mean it's absolutely true. You need to vet your sources. Is this realistic? Now, I get information from Facebook, and, I, and believe me, five years ago, I thought, ah, oh, there's no way I would ever get news from Facebook. Just last week, my wife was leaving with our daughter to, to meet her somewhere on Bigger Road, 
and I noticed the Kettering police had posted on their Facebook page that there was a car accident and Bigger Road was closed. So I called her on the phone and said, don't go that way, you're going to get stuck in traffic. That's the most recent incident where I feel like, you know, I got information and value out of that. For the most part, it's communication, but it's not necessarily um, full-time legit communication. Uh, it's more, you know, social interaction. However, more and more media outlets are posting to Facebook, to Twitter, to Instagram, breaking news. So this is a whole new information age and a whole new way to get it, which is, which again, changes the aspect of you go report the story, you go back to the office, you write it, you process the images, you turn them in, somebody puts it together and publishes it. You know, now it's, it's instantaneous. It happens now and five minutes later, a thousand people are looking at it. So that has changed the whole dynamic. Cell phones have also changed the dynamic. Everybody has a, a camera in their phone and everybody's constantly taking pictures with that. Now the quality today is good enough to use for publication. Five years ago that wasn't the case, but now they are good enough. I personally have never published a picture from my phone I, and I don't shoot a lot with my phone because I have a hard time looking at a screen. I'm used to holding a camera, putting my eye to a viewfinder. That's just because I'm a di dinosaur in that aspect. I'm not used to it. You've been doing it all the time, so you can actually control and you probably are very good at framing a picture on, on your phone. I'm not. As you're good at, that means that's fine. That's a, another tool. Understand though, you've got no, you, you no ability to change your angle of view much. You don't have a zoom lens. What you see is what you get. You don't have much light capabilities. I mean, you've got a little bit of flash if you have to. However, there's many instances where the cell phone takes the picture covering news where it becomes important and it becomes very worthwhile and that's where, you know, it, it works out. Uh, let me start the slideshow here. Let's, how do I get out of this thing? I click on, that certainly wasn't it. There we go. Let's see here. see it yeah but that's really weird why is it not here is this showing everything that's on here Oh, right here it is. Hold on. Right there. <coughs> okay. I think. I think. But it, it's not showing the show, though. It's uh, That just opened it. Um, there. Okay, let's hit that. There we go. That should make it work. There we go. All right. How many of you have seen this picture in the last 10 days? Guy standing across the street from where the plane crashed into the apartment building, takes his cell phone out, takes a picture, gets used all over the place. It's been on CNN, NBC, every newspaper in the country, magazine. This is the right time to use your cell phone. Which, by the way, is a plane crash. In Akron, the, the plane stopped in Dayton, flew to Akron. Um, got caught in the fog and apparently the story they've released now is the fact that possibly there was an error with the aviation, avionics equipment and maybe the pilots thought the plane was higher in the air than it actually was. Um, as, a, as a news photo, this is a terrific picture. Look on the right side, the guy standing there talking on his cell phone, well he's only half of him's in the frame. You need to just crop him out and then suddenly the pictures improve dramatically. That's just a simple process of going into Photoshop, cropping it, and moving on. Uh, kind of like the composition of it. It's a pretty nice photo for someone who probably has no training whatsoever. American Pharaoh is the first Triple Crown winner in 70 or 30 some years, and this is actually winning the, the third race of the Triple Crown. But notice everyone in the foreground is holding up a camera phone. 
the photographers who were covering this event, there was a photo editor from Sports Illustrated with them. His job was to download their discs and send the images to New York. He noticed the previous race as the horses came across the finish line, everybody held up their phone to take a picture. So he borrowed a camera from one of the other photographers and said, I'm going to try this shot and see what happens. And of course, he ends up getting the cover because it's a, this is, I think, a, this is almost a cultural icon moment of what's going on. And it's a pretty well done image. Uh, lots of space around it sets the scene well, yet you see the horse immediately. So it really, really works very well. And I, I pulled this picture off another website with permission, but they had already put the red circle on it, and I don't know how to get rid of it. So, and, and I'm very unskilled with anything tricky with Photoshop. Uh, this is the Pope's visit to Philadelphia. And the only person not trying to take a picture is the old lady. And this probably is also some statement of, of the social, social aspect or psychology of our society today that everybody else needs to get a picture on their phone and go home and say, look, I saw the Pope. I wonder how many of these people actually have a picture of the Pope. And she just enjoyed the moment and probably went home and watched it on TV and will remember that in her mind. Sometimes I wonder if we spend too much time holding our phones up and trying to take a picture and not savoring the moment, and are we really remembering it? Do we see it, and does it make a lasting impression on us? Um, my thoughts, again, I'm 64 years old, so I have a little different perspective, um, but I'm trying. I'm working on it, getting there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty bizarre. Uh, composition, content, moments, uh, that's what creates or makes pictures that, that are, are communicate with people. This is from the Olympic trials in uh, 1996. Uh, this woman uh, is a, uh, trying out for the Olympic diving team and she's uh, 35 years old at the time. Had they thought no chance to make the team, and ironically, on this particular dive, she did. Uh, you can go ahead and grab that. Um, NBC was televising the, this event, and every day we could shoot from anywhere we wanted. Well, for the Sunday for the finals, they put this flag up behind the diving boards and then told all the still photographers that you can't go and shoot from these angles because that's our, that's our shot. We set this up for TV, and you can't do it. And of course, tell a photographer you can't do it, and that's the worst thing you can do because we're going to do it then. Uh, and fortunately, I had uh, been there for six days and had gotten to know this maintenance guy who ran the worked at the pool, and I told him what happened. He goes, oh, yeah. And I said, well, see that catwalk over there? Is there a chance I can go over there? He goes, sure, come on with me. So walked over there, walked up into the catwalk, bingo. Now the divers are against the flag. So... Uh, it's a little bit of a coup, but then again, it's also there's some luck involved in the fact that the motor drive captured her right where, you know, this is, this is somewhat, uh, you know, there, there's 50 other divers going by, too, that aren't in this particular position. That's the editing aspect, too, looking at what you've shot and finding the image that works. And the editing is as equally as important sometimes as the, as the content. Oops, there we go. Uh, this is the Schuster Center in downtown Dayton when they opened it. Uh, this is the condominium side. And this group uh, is a, uh, a ballet rappelling rock climbing group called Bandaloop. And they rappelled off the building. And you can see some of the lines. They're not, they didn't just dive onto the street, which would have been cool. <laughs> but after looking around, you're trying to figure out how am I going to make these people stand out from the building. And... Finally, I, and you ask, have to ask a lot of questions. One of the things when you're going out to do something, no matter what you're photographing, ask questions beforehand. Go prepared. There's nothing worse than walking into a situation just as it starts. You have no idea exactly what's going to transpire. Is this person going to talk? Is this person going to come onto the stage? Or are, these gonna, are they going to jump around? Or what are they going to do? 
It gives you an idea. You need ammunition to think about to where do you need to be and where do you need to position yourself. So here, I decided I'd lay down on the sidewalk when they would dive. But they said they're going to dive off and then they'll catch onto the building and then they'll rappel down. Well, they don't show up against the building very well. And for only a few seconds were they against the sky like this. So after uh, probably three frames after this, everything, you know, you couldn't even see them anymore. I'm a Mac guy. This is confusing me. <laughs> sports, I've shot a lot of sports in my life, and a lot of the best photos don't actually happen when you're hitting the ball or kicking the ball or catching the ball or shooting the ball. So you need to pay attention again. Just because a play ends doesn't mean it's over. Continue to follow it to see the player's reactions, the intensity. Um, th th those photos sometimes evoke far more emotion from the reader than just two guys and one guy shooting the ball and the other guy's holding his hands up. Those are kind of a dime a dozen. Anybody can sit under the basket and do that. So you need to pay attention. Uh, this is photo was shot long before any of you were born. In 1985, when uh, Villanova upset Georgetown to win the NCAA championship, and that's the Villanova coach, Wally Massimino. Before the Schuster Center downtown became the Schuster Center, it was Reichs, and they imploded the building. That was the only way they felt that they could actually get it torn down in a logical way without totally disrupting downtown for months. So when you use 175 sticks of dynamite to get rid of a building, you've got to rope off the area to make sure nobody gets hurt. So there was going to be no place to, to stand and take a picture of the building coming down. And we had been working with the people. This whole started three months before they actually blew the building up. They started talking to the media about what was going to happen. And it dawned on me my attorney's office was in the Liberty Bank building, which is a catty corner across the street, and it's on the 20th floor. So I called him. And I said, you know, here's what's going to happen, and I'm wondering if I can photograph it out your window, looking right down on it. And he said, sure. And so then we had to clear that with the people who are going to blow the building up. They came over and looked out the window said, my, this is a great view. We'd like to come up here, too, and watch it. And then they told all the TV stations. And so suddenly my little image is no longer an exclusive everybody and their brothers up there. There were about six or seven of us up there. Bottom line is, it's the only picture, the only view where you actually can see the building fall down. Everything else is looking three blocks away up this street, four blocks away down this street. All of this area up here, those streets are all closed. And moments after this thing finally hit the ground, there was rolling walls of dust that enveloped downtown for a couple of hours. So, uh, and we just, I put the camera on a tripod, used a motor drive, shot a sequence of the building from the first puff to until it was nothing but a ball of dust. But this is the picture we used on the front page that kind of singularly says Reichs is going down. Again, you're up high looking down at the building, finding a place to be. Here, I'm on the ground looking up. Pay attention to to where you need to be. And again, this is all the thought process. My brain says, what if I do this? I look up here, someone will go, oh, I've never seen it like that before. This is a construction site at Miami Valley Hospital. There'll be some other photos there. I, I photographed when they built the new tower downtown. I photographed that for them over, I think, 19 months. I went there every Friday and updated what was going on and shot some documentary photos that we made a little time lapse out of to show it going from a hole in the ground to a complete building. Moments, um, emotional moments, quiet moments, they, all photos don't have to just shout at you. This was when they closed the truck plant at Moraine. The last 1,000 employees lost their jobs when the last truck came off the line, and there was no access to go in the plant to see the truck, to talk to the employees or anything. We were all actually told to stay across the street, and we all did, and there was no real view to see the people walking out of the building or anything. So it went on for most of the day because they, there was the last line, and we weren't exactly sure. They wouldn't even tell us when the last truck was going to come off the line. We knew it was going to be before 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So anyway, after four or five hours standing out there and just making some mediocre photographs, I got kind of bored, walked over to my car and poured another cup of coffee, and I saw this side parking lot where the employees were. And all of a sudden, I see these two people walking toward their cars, 
So I just picked up the camera and watched them for a second, and this is pretty much serendipity. I, I was hoping they'd go to these cars because they were the closest to me. They stopped, hugged. I got about three frames off, and she got in the, in the silver car, and, and I believe it's a he, got in the Jeep, and they drove off. I don't know their names. I yelled at them. I said, hey, I'd like to talk to you. Well, I wasn't uh, technically allowed to go on the property. They just got in their cars and drove away. So it, a moment of, you know, when the plant closed. And there were very few moments from that day where we could, you know, make a picture of anything that really said anything. Yeah. Uh, if you're standing in a public place on public property and you can see it, you can photograph it. And you can publish the picture if you want, no problem. When you go onto private property, at that point you need permission. Uh, you'll notice the Dayton Mall has a sign that no photography allowed. They consider that private property, and it is. While it's open to the public, it's not owned by the public. It's, it's not the county. It's not a sidewalk. It, that is, a, that is um, a private property that they're inviting you to come and buy their stuff, but that doesn't mean you can take pictures. Now, their theory is their merchants don't want you to photograph their displays or their prices or their items for sale, and they're trying to protect their, their merchants and renters. I'm not sure that's really true or not. Now, we can go there and do stories by asking permission, and they'll send a security guy with us, and we can go talk to people and take pictures there. Um, you invade someone's privacy when you, if you, the ex my best example is if I'm standing on the sidewalk in front of somebody's house, and their living room window's open, and they're standing in there, I can take their picture. When they close the drapery, they're telling me no more photos. So at that point, if I walk up onto their property and try and take a picture through the window, now I'm invading their privacy. I'm trespassing also. In most cases, you, uh, if you're in public and someone says, I don't want you to take my picture unless you have a compelling reason why, it's probably a good idea not to. If it's a news event where... Uh, there's a car accident, there's a fire, there's been a shooting or something like that, all bets are off. Take pictures. If, if you're standing in public, fine. Even if you're in a private area, uh, the, the episode in Paris last week at the rock and roll concert in the concert hall, moments before the attack happened, somebody shot a photo of everybody holding up their beers looking at the stage. Well, that, that picture turns out to be really, really important now. Uh, because some of those people were victims. At the time, it was just a snapshot of the evening and wasn't intended to be a news photo at all, and then it became one. Um, that's a fine line there, uh, but it's, I, don't know how, I don't know who would object to that necessarily. But you, you do have to be respectful of people's privacy, and particularly in this day and age when people are becoming more and more private and more concerned. Mm -hmm. Was on it. Yes. Um, and like the press was like going on, and the guy came saying that you can't take his picture, and they want press to, and they asked the kids for them to take that, and they were it got into big arguments. And I feel like they were both in the right, but I was just wondering like what is the perspective for you? That was the that was the University of Missouri. That was the um, episode where the fellow was on a hunger strike to try and uh, deal with the racial issues on the campus, and a communications instructor told the fellow, she put his hand, her hand up in front of his camera and said, you can't videotape this. Um, the University of Missouri is a public school in the state of Missouri that is, that is that's considered public property. And you, he has every right. If they're staging a sit-in or a discussion there on the campus and she says, you can't photograph it, She's actually violating his right, protected by the First Amendment, to report. And she was dead wrong. She also resigned the next day because she was completely mistaken. She also said, I need some muscle over here to move this guy. Well, that's another thing. Don't threaten people. That's just stupid. Um, at the University of Dayton, that's not a public university. 
they can tell you to get off the campus anytime they want. Right state? No. When you're out in the public area, that is, that's state-owned property, you've got a right to be there. You don't have to be a student to be there. Once you go in their buildings, I think that's a little different. Uh, when you're outside, though, it's, it's pretty much free. Uh, that was a, she made a bad decision on that all the way around. Um, and if you looked at other newscasts, this was one particular group of people together. There was another whole group of people up on the main college green, if you will, and there were 50 photographers up there. So it's, am I answering the question? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm, just I'm just mumbling around here. Uh, you had someone? Well, I, yeah, you use the rule of thirds to a point, but that doesn't mean that's the only way to do it. Um, some, take all your basic tenets of photography and your composition and your rule of thirds and light, and then continue to use those, but also try to explore how can I bend those rules a bit to make better photographs, make more interesting pictures. So occasionally, I think I, I can show you a couple examples where I break a rule and, and I think it works. Um, this is just from the Olympic trials in Atlanta, uh, or actually it's from the actual Olympics, uh, uh, the 400 meter. I just kind of like the light, the splash, again, the design and the composition. If I'm using a wide angle lens, I want to show everything there. I want the background to work for it. If you're going to include all that information, make it interesting. If you're going away from the wide angle lens, I tend to use a longer telephoto lens with very little depth of field so the background's out of focus. I either want all the background to work or I kind of don't want any of it to get in the way. And that, that again is, is imperative that you think about where do I stand, how do I move, and do I go right up high, do I get down low, how do I make that all come together. But you've got to learn to make these decisions very, very quickly. Otherwise, pictures get away from you. That's why you need to be very comfortable with your equipment, understand how it works, where the controls are on it, so you're not fumbling with the camera, fumbling with the lens, doing this, doing that, while good pictures are going away or happening in front of you and you're not making them. So. <clears throat> This is a situation that might talk a little bit about privacy. Um, there was a, a homeless camp in downtown Dayton near a set of railroad tracks, and the police went in, and they wanted to clean it up and get the people in some help and get them moved out of the area. This woman had lived there for a number of months, and the reporter and I went along with the cops, and you need to establish a relationship with your with your subjects, your clients, your subjects. You need to, you don't just walk in and start shooting photos and go, hi, I'm from the paper, I'm from WOUB or whatever, and we're going to do this. In a situation like this where you're actually kind of invading their home, and they're actually being told they're going to need to leave their home, I didn't take any pictures right away. We asked her, if, you know, we're really sorry about this situation. We're from the newspaper. We want to talk to you about how this comes about and what it's going to do to you. And after five or six minutes, she warmed up and she was fine. And so then after another five or ten minutes, I said, do you mind if I shoot some photos? No, that, that's okay. So she gave us her, her name, and which is the most, most media outlets, if you ask a person their name and they answer, that's pretty much them giving you permission to use their photos. There are no model releases involved. You don't sign anything like that. If they're over 18 and you say, I'm from the newspaper, my name's Skip Peters, and I shot your photo, can I get your name? Yeah, I'm Susie Jackson. Bingo. That's your permission to use the photo. If they say, no, I don't want my name given, well, that's pretty much telling you the picture's not going to be worthwhile anyway. You can't tell anybody who it is. And most photos without names on them are not terribly valuable. Um, she was, again, you, you develop a relationship with your subject and ask them questions. That's how you make good photographs, too. You need to get some information. So what do I need to show? What makes them special? What makes them unique? What makes them newsworthy? And then at that point, when you start to ask questions, pay attention. Don't go, uh-huh, 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 while you're taking pictures. They'll catch on real quick that you're not paying any attention. And that will kind of ruin the relationship very quickly.
again, composition, angle of view. Uh, this is an Indianapolis 500 race car. And for the most part, they all kind of look alike, only the colors change. Uh, so just trying to find a different way to do it, literally holding the camera arm's length over, over them with digital cameras now and the ability to preview on the back of them. You know, you shoot three or four photos, take a look at the back of the camera, what's going on here, and get back up there. Looking at the back of the camera, um, it's unbelievable how much time we spend staring at what we photographed. And I'm guilty of it too, and I'm trying very, very hard to do less and less of it, but you want to see what you got. So you shoot six or eight photos, and then you look at the back of the camera, and it's zinka, zinka, zinka. Go to a, if you go to a basketball game, watch the photographer sitting underneath the basket. They come up, score a basket. Teams takes off the other way. Look down at the photographers. Every one of them is looking at the back of their camera. It's just, it's funny. But we probably should spend less time doing that and more time paying attention to pictures. You can look at them when you get back and put them on, the, on your screen. This is at the GM truck plant years ago before it closed. And you notice how there's all this clutter. Use a wide aperture so there's no depth of field. Shoot with a long telephoto lens. Make him pop out. Make that background go away. This way the, the reader, the viewer, can see what you're trying to talk about. It's a story about this guy who's worked there for I don't know how many years and how many thousands of rear axles he's assembled. Little side light, little critical focus. It's not super, super sharp, but the eyes are sharp, and the eyes for me in almost every photo, if the eyes are in focus, then there's something going on there. Eyes tell the, tell the reader, tell the viewer what about the person. Even in babies, it works. Um, in most cases, you never want anything growing out of somebody's head. Uh, in a Catholic church, I thought it was probably okay to have the crucifix back there. I just made sure it was a little out of focus, and I thought it was actually kind of interesting. The only time in my life I've ever thought it was interesting that something was growing out of someone's head. Uh, angle of view. Oh, that one's going to go away really quick. Don't touch this thing. It's really, really touchy. Um, that was a, at a, a car show early in the morning, the sunlight, the angle of view there. This is just a different view from the same particular event. You need to look around scenes. Don't just walk in and pick one angle of view and say, okay, this is it, I'm going to stay here. You need to look at it from this side of the room, look at it from that side of the room, walk to the back of the room and take a look around too. Just make sure. Anytime you're out doing something, make sure you walk 360 degrees around the scene to make sure you've seen it from all angles. Maybe you don't need to shoot it, but look at it. Make sure that you didn't leave something on the table that would have made a nice photograph or a different one. If you're covering a news event or you're going somewhere where there's a press conference or there's a whole group of photographers and video people there, if they're all over here, they're all seeing the same scene. I immediately go to the other side to make sure because odds are it might not necessarily be a lot better, but it's different. If they're all shooting with a telephoto lens, I'll put a wide angle lens on. If they're all up on a ladder, I might try and, you know, or if they're all up on a podium, I'm going to try and get down on the field or down on a lower angle. That's what makes them special. That's where you make different photographs. Sometimes it doesn't work and you have to suck it up and go back and shoot the same photo with the rest of them because you do have to come back with an image. Every time you go out, you got to come back with something we can use. But when you push the envelope after you get something in the camera, then try to find something special. Design, composition, make lines work, make light work. This is more in photo editing here. Just because it's all there on your computer screen doesn't mean all of that's in important. That's where cropping and editing to clean things up, make your lines, make your horizons work for you. Uh, key off of the, the accents here, the, the blue lines in the background, which are just reflecting off of a car. Um, I, it all makes it a more interesting image. Does it ever look like that? Pardon? Does it look like that? Oh, yeah, I'm there too. <laughs> I'm a little distorted in that. I'm not nearly that wide, I don't think. <laughs> I'm, 
Interesting that you picked that up right away. How many of you saw that? Good. No, it's, I didn't want people to see it, but it's, you know, sometimes the, the reflection, you can't help yourself. Uh, this is the standard view of Miami Valley Hospital. I shot this same picture every Friday for 19 months, and this is the one we use to make a little time-lapse video thing of the hospital being built. But we're now at the halfway point of the construction where all the metal is up, and they wanted it's kind of a neat photo to use. Um, and shooting it during the day, it just didn't have anything going on. But I, I drove by it one evening, and my wife and I were going out to have dinner, and I saw the thing glowing. I went, wait a minute, we got to shoot this at dusk. And early morning, a little before sunrise, the sky is, is picking up that, the sun coming up, and it's very intense. And from about 20 minutes before sunset to about a half an hour after sunset, it's just a great time of day. The light is incredible. Now, this is actually shot. The sun's gone down, but you can still see some glow over on the right-hand side. But uh, this is about a 15 or 20-second time exposure on a tripod, and it just builds depth and richness to the, to the sky. Uh, and also gives, makes the lights pop a little bit better. I did all kinds of photographs while I was photographing this project. They later turned it into a book they gave away at the dedication to a select group of people. They, we printed 300 copies of a 56-page book. Uh, I shot 70,000 pictures over the time period. And we then called that down to around 500. And I think we used maybe 100 in the book. You know, I don't know because with the digital cards now, you can do, you know, I, get, I, sh I shoot, I don't use large cards, and I can get 500 images on one, uh, which is about five gigabytes, four gigs. When I shot film on a at a sporting event, I would figure if I got two pictures for every 36, it was a pretty good roll of film. And on a football game, at an Ohio State football game, I would shoot 10 or 12 rolls of film, which is 360 to 400 and some photos. And I'm, if I got 10, I had a great day. Some days you only had four or five that ran good. Uh, but now the ratio, I don't know. I kind of look at it as one per roll. <laughs> uh, and I don't know. And now, because it's so easy to shoot so much, um, digital photography is kind of machine gun photography. You can just bang away, and it doesn't cost you anything, and then you delete what you don't like. I mean, it used to be every, every roll of film you shot cost money. You had time to process it. You had to look at it, edit it, print it. it was, the process is so dramatically different. The reason we switched to digital, when we bought the cameras in 1998, we bought 10 digital Canon cameras and lenses for everybody. The cameras were... $32,000 a piece, but they cut us a deal and we got them for 28000 So I bought over a quarter million dollars worth of cameras at one time, and then another hundred and some thousand dollars worth of lenses because we were switching from Nikon to Canon. At that time, we were spending $260,000 a year on film and chemistry for the photographers. In less than two years, we got our money back by not having to buy any more film and chemistry. Then the prices of the cameras started to come down, and it evolved. And so, I mean, it, the, those cameras are absolute dead weight. They're totally worthless in this day and age. Uh, but at the time, they were the state of the art. So, kind of weird. Got off subject there. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, this is the Miami Valley Construction Project again. Paying attention to converging lines and your wide-angle lens and how to make it kind of work, but also paying attention to your horizons and setting images into a, into a, a scene. Yes? I think it's kind of neat. Uh, I think it's going to create discipline. You're going to, you can't just go click, 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 click. You're going to pay more attention to composition. You're going to wait and push the button. I th Pardon? Yes, yes. And processing a roll of film today, to get a roll of black and white film processed is 10 bucks because it's so rare and there's so little of it and so it's expensive to do it. And it's almost unbelievable. 
uh, how it's all completely changed. I think that I, what I miss is the thought process when you're only, you only have 36 exposures. I, the other day, I was shooting something for someone, and I shot 15 pictures of the same scene, just like that. And I thought, how stupid are you? What are you doing? You knew the first three were fine. Stop it. But it's almost like, well, I got the motor drive and bing, bing, bing. You just do it. That's, that takes away some of the thought process and being critical about what you're doing and how I'm going to shoot it. And click, I got one chance at it. So I think it's fine. I think anything that slows us down and makes us more thoughtful about our composition and our content is a good idea. It was like 10 degrees outside when I shot these photos, and when you're up about six stories in that place and the wind is howling, it gets really, really cold. So I was only up there for about 15 or 20 minutes, and uh, this guy had to be there all day. And he didn't seem to mind at all. The sun doesn't always have to be over your shoulder. Pay attention to shadows and angles. And again, keeping your lines, just thinking. Anytime you put the wide angle lens on, you need to make sure your brain's in gear. It's important because you can, you can make really, really nice pictures and you can make really, really <coughs> awkward photos that don't work well. Paying attention to faces again. I mean, this guy's just leveling up steps on a staircase. And he was, I watched this guy for 15 minutes. And he's intense and, and meticulous and, and a real craftsman. Um, in construction trades, I've been around it just enough now. I have a tremendous appreciation for people who build things. They, it's, they're not just a bunch of guys driving pickup trucks. They really aren't. They're hardworking and they're thoughtful and they're really good at what they do. And this is the final project, a finished photo of what the place looked like. And kept waiting to find it a day, an evening again, where there were some clouds in the sky. Um, and I was, I was at home and I looked up and saw all these clouds and I was, man, I better go down there and see if this will work. And again, this is paying attention. Sometimes you have to move right away. Uh, things happen and be ready. I carry my camera. I, I don't have it with me today, but I also don't work every day. But when, from the time I was in college, when I started to work for the student newspaper at Ohio U until I retired, I carried my camera everywhere I went. It was always with me. I took it to class at OU. When I went to lunch, I carried one camera with me. What if some car careens down the street and hits five people and all that stuff? I can make a picture of it. Well, you know, if you don't have your camera with you, you'll have to tell somebody about it. So you need to react and you need to always be ready. When, I, when cameras, before they had automatic exposure, if I'm driving in the car, I made sure the f-stop and shutter speed was set for the prevailing light outside just in case I had to grab the camera and shoot a picture. It's be prepared. It's kind of like a Boy Scout. Yes? Absolutely. I shot this same photo from the same location every week. So, yeah, it was like the sixth floor of the parking garage right by the edge of the elevator was where I shot the same photo, and that way I knew I could go to the same place every time. So, yeah, you can lay them over each other, and they're awfully close. On the time lapse, if you do a, an honest to goodness time lapse, you're going to mount a camera and let it sit there in the same place. Well, I couldn't mount a camera and leave it sitting in the parking garage. So our time lapse, it moves just a bit, uh, but it's, it still works. Um, covering news and politics, uh, it's, this is real documentary kind of stuff. What you've got to do is go there and capture the scene, capture the essence of what's going on, make it interesting, but you've also got to be fair about it. Uh, politics has changed quite a bit over the years. The manipulating the media is, uh, is pretty amazing, how everything is very carefully orchestrated so that the, the candidate's message is delivered in a certain way. Um, but you need to look past all that and just pay attention to what's going on there. And here, just kind of, there was no way to make it anything other than have him in the dead center of the image. 
So let's center him up and then make everything else out of focus, use a critical focus on a long lens. And continually looking for the right moment there, it's so easy when someone's talking to make them look bad, make them look stupid, have their mouth in the wrong position. So you need to be careful when you're editing so you're making fair photographs and, and re, you know, publishing fair stuff. Even shooting a wide angle lens, I shot at a really wide aperture so only Kasich's face would be sharp, make sure everything else is out of focus. If these guys are in focus, it completely flattens the picture. Current presidential candidate, yeah. Uh, this is uh, Barack Obama when he was still running the primary in 2000, when was it, 07? Oh, 07? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's got a million more gray hairs now. Uh, he's still as fit and trim, but he is not, um, he's got a lot of gray hair. I realized this last night, I have photographed every president since Richard Nixon in 1972. And I thought about that driving home last night. Uh, and I'm hoping I don't photograph any more because it's just become such hard work. It is so time consuming and the Secret Service is so demanding. It's no, to photograph, um, when he uh, came to Wright State, he was scheduled to speak at 10 a.m. I had to be there at 5 a.m. and put, yeah, and they've already got all the information on me anyway. They've issued my credentials. I've had Secret Service credentials since the 70s when I photographed Nixon when I was in college. And you get there at 5 a.m., have to put all your equipment down, and you have to leave and go outside, and they have bomb-sniffing dogs and all this other stuff. And then, then, you know, an hour later, they let you come back in, and then you sit for four hours doing nothing. And, and the public is, in most cases, closer than we are. There's people sitting in the front row who can photograph them with a wide-angle lens, and I'm 150 feet back on a podium. It's just difficult. It's so anyway, it's not much fun anymore. But anyway, it's, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I think it's pretty cool how many presidents I photograph, but it's, um, I, I'm kind of done with that. You can, yes, yeah. Are you reverting to uh, your original plan? Uh, yeah, it was kind of weird because if you have a, if you go as the general public without a credential, you can do whatever you want. As soon as they give you a credential, they tell you where you can go. You can go over here on this podium. You can go over here on this riser. You can be down here, and that's all you can do. So the public frequently has, is closer. Your chances of guaranteeing making a fo good photo, though are much less because of the way the Secret Service blocks your view. So, you know, it's it's six to one, half a dozen the other. Well, no, it's not. It's actually probably better with the credential, but you need the lenses and, and the angles. So uh, this is one where we're talking about the composition, and there's actually eight flags behind him, but if you put him in the middle of eight flags, I didn't find it a very interesting photo. So I put him a little off center and, and still made it work. Uh, if, you'll, if you ever watch his press conferences or any time he's speaking, and this is the classic Barack Obama pose where he turns slightly to his side and looks up, uh, he's a master at it. And he also knows where the cameras are, and he pauses. There will also be situations with some of the, pardon? Mm -hmm. Yep. This is all part of the carefully orchestrated campaign or the, or ability to look good and pause and yeah it's it's all for the pictures um, their their handlers and PR people will also give you a script sometimes in advance and say well you know here's the speech they give you a copy of the speech and they go the speech lasts 11 minutes and 45 seconds at about the four minute mark he's going to turn and go over to this side of the stage and so he'll be looking this way and that, that'll make a real nice picture for you over here and then at the eight minute mark in the thing, he's going to walk over here and talk to those people in the fourth row. So that'll be a good scene for you there. It's like, oh my goodness, none of this is you know, natural. It's, it's all very carefully orchestrated. I mean, some of it is. 
but a lot of it is not. And, and that also is kind of odd. It makes you feel like you're just you're being told, well, here's the cheat sheet, shoot picture number one, number two, number three, number four. So that the spontaneity of these situations is becoming less and less and less. Um, and that's where Donald Trump clearly has no one handling him. He says whatever he wants, and that makes it interesting. It's, you're really reporting when you're covering that guy. Uh, and I haven't, and, and I'd like to keep that that way too, really. <laughs> so, um, I was somewhat criticized that I was making fun of Hillary Clinton with this photo. Uh, it was just her walking onto stage at a rally in Huber Heights, and that was her reaction as she walked out. And a couple of people said, you know, I was trying to make her look bad. And I, and I said, no, I was trying to show that the fact that she was really excited and surprised. And so, you know, we'll have to take that for what it's worth. Uh, I like, it's a picture like that that I like that is more spontaneous. Um, John McCain, he's spontaneous. He was also late for everything he did. He was... Uh, and, re and here's something else that's interesting. Democrats are characteristically late. If they're going to be there at 10 o'clock, they show up at 10.30. Republicans, if they're going to be there at 9, they're there at 9. He said he'd be there at 9, and he got there at 10.30. Uh, we, he did a thing at Young's Jersey Dairy. He was supposed to be there at 11 o'clock. He got there at 2.30 in the afternoon. It's like, oh, how can we be this far off schedule? Um, which messes up deadlines and all kinds of other frustration. <coughs> Uh, Michelle Obama came to Dayton when he was running the campaign the last time. And this, when you go to any event, you need to shoot it wide, you need to shoot a medium shot, you need to shoot a tight shot, you need to make sure you've covered it fully. So we've set the scene, we zoom in a little bit, and then we also key in on our primary subject. So I'm shooting this event alone. Um, in, in most cases, wire services will have two photographers at most political things. Uh, in her case, she only was worthy of one. <laughs> so anyway, this particular picture of her walking out, I just shot as a safety shot. I saw, I knew she was coming out that way, so I figured I'll just shoot a couple of pictures of her walking on. Women's Wear Daily picked this, it was shot for the Associated Press. Women's Wear Daily picked this picture up, put it on their website, and critiqued her fashion for that day, uh, her physique with her muscles and all that. This thing got like a million hits the next day online. And I'm going, my God, is, you know, and that, that was a, almost an afterthought. I almost didn't transmit the photo to them. So there's an interesting dynamic going on now with social media and how quickly photos can get out there and the various uses of them. Um, we set the scene. She's in the convention center speaking to a crowd. Then we move in for your medium shot. We still maintain the people in the background. And I said, could you guys hold that Ohio up now? No. Uh, and, and I do believe that this was um, carefully, carefully orchestrated, knowing that, the, that there was a photo platform over here. So that, that they didn't just happen to do that, I don't believe. And then we get into the tight image. And again, it's, you have to shoot a lot of pictures of people when they're talking, when you're shooting them up tight like this. And that's when you do need to look at the back of the camera to see, do they look stupid? Are their eyes closed? Is their mouth in a weird position? So you need to make sure you've got something that is, is a, a good solid image and yet you know, is, is accurate and, and interesting. Um, we then had a little, we had a secret rendezvous where she was going to go to his campaign headquarters where they're making phone calls. They invited two TV crews and me, the AP, to go along. So we got hustled in a limousine with the Secret Service and rushed through Dayton over to this office where she was going to surprise the, the volunteers, uh, which was kind of cool. And anyway, she comes in and hugs them, and it's a very spontaneous moment. And it's kind of nice because there weren't 25 photographers there shooting the same thing. And then they had her make a phone call to, uh, to one of the supporters. And this is her trying to convince the lady in Beaver Creek that it really is Michelle Obama. And the woman's going, oh, this is a crank call. Who is it really? And she didn't believe her. And this was her trying to do that. 
again, this photo gets picked up by Yahoo News, and they did a, a, a caption contest the next day. And again, you know, there's 150,000 hits on this picture the next day, you know, in, in, in an hour. So it's, it's very interesting today and in how it used to be you went and you covered the whole event, and then you went and you processed and you edited and you sent your stuff. Now, as soon as the event starts, in most cases, if there's two photographers there, you shoot like three minutes and hand off your disk, and they transmit a photo as quickly as they can to get it out there. Uh, so the whole social media aspect and immediacy of things has changed over the last five years quite a bit. Yes. Yes. Day rate uh, by the assignment. By the assignment, it ranges anywhere from depending on the assignment, uh, one hundred and fifty dollars to four hundred dollars per day. Per day. Yeah. Um, and they get their though they those photos are theirs forever, and can be resold and reused, whatever. So it's. I keep the original copies, but I can't do anything with them. Uh, these are a series of portraits I did uh, for uh, foster children for a calendar for children's services. And this is strictly about backgrounds uh, and composition and making sure that, the, that what you want people to see, and this is faces really. Uh, so I pretty much made all the backgrounds go away. And tried to allow the kids, try to encourage them to be themselves, which is when you're dealing with people, you point a camera at somebody, they tend to back up, put their shoulders back, look straight at you, hold their breath. They become very uncomfortable. Most people don't like to be photographed. They're intimidated by it, so you need to break them down a little bit. And children are a little bit easier to work with because they're less intimidated, but you need to let people give them a chance to warm up to you. Uh, try to get them in a comfortable situation for people. For one thing, when they back up against the wall, say, please, no, 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 come out away from the wall. We don't want the wall in the photo. And, and fold your arms across your chest. You'll be a lot more relaxed like that. And then actually you kind of want them also to turn a little to their side. When you photograph someone straight on, their shoulders look wider. No matter how big you are, you look wider if you're shot straight on. Just turn a little bit to the side. Diminishes the width of the body. It also allows them to relax a little bit, put their head down, take a deep breath, exhale. When you exhale, your body relaxes. Suddenly your face isn't tight. Now the other problem is some people exhale and then they'll breathe again, then they turn blue because people tend actually to hold their breath while they're being photographed. And you gotta get them to say, no, please. Ah, click. So um, dealing with kids, it's kind of the same thing, but you try and make them, let them be in their environment. And this little guy, he couldn't stand still. We were at a park, and he was running all over the place. And I said, well, so he is going across this bridge the other way, walking away from me. And I went, well, that's pretty cool. I said, turn around and try it. Come back to me. And all of a sudden, it's a, it's a case frequently. You can work with people so long, and you're just not making any pictures. And then something usually clicks, and then you're done. My rule of thumb is also after 20 minutes, if you haven't made a good picture in 20 minutes, there's a good chance you're not going to. It's just you're going to have to deal with what you got. But you need to allow people a little bit of time to get used to you and warm up, and then you can start to move. Sports is sports. Uh, so much of it is about you know kicking, hitting, throwing the ball, and that's all part of the, part of the game. And you need those photos, but you also need to stay with the story, stay with the moment, and get some reaction. Um, every, just because the play ends, don't put the camera down. Stay on and see what's going on. Um, I, some of these pictures I find far more interesting than two guys. No, I can't remember either. <laughs> that was two years ago, I think. Um, 
I tend to try not to just photograph sitting under the basket or in the end zone or, you know, try and move around and look for something a little different. Um, and again, if all the photographers are sitting here, I'm going to go sit over there. Uh, if everyone's sitting side by side, you're all going to make the same photo. You're all probably using the same lens. There's nothing interesting about that other than one guy works for the Dayton Daily News, one guy works for the Cincinnati Enquirer, and one guy works for AP. You know, that's kind of silly. Uh, this is a photo story, and I'll go through this reasonably quickly. A uh, 16-year-old girl from Miamisburg who wanted, wants to be a race car driver. And so I spent a day with her at a racetrack and covered the race. And here she is um, with who would, was at one time her boyfriend, no longer. That, that ended. Uh, they were both race car drivers, by the way. Uh, her dad owned the race car and was the crew chief. And here we're, he's, they're talking about the strategy. And then before the race, there's sort of this <coughs> little tension moment of, you know, dad's still looking at the car, and she's kind of getting her game face on, I think. Maybe that's what it's about. And then her game face comes through, um, and suddenly she doesn't look like a 16-year-old anymore. Uh, and during the race... These are called midgets. Uh, they're small race cars that go about 120 miles an hour. You think she won? Yeah. All right, didn't. That's a, that's a quick and dirty newspaper picture story where you can use all those photos on one page of the story and move through it. Five or six pictures is all you're going to get in a space like that. Um, questions. That's all I've got to show you. Well, I, I thought you had questions. <laughs> you had prepped questions. Yeah. No, you, you answered, prepped questions. You answered, you answered all of them. I answered all of them? Yeah. Really? I got 100% on this test? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So. Yes. Um, yeah, it was a, this was, uh, my kids, my oldest daughter is now 37. So this probably happened 36 years ago. Um, and a kid was struck <laughs> by a car, riding a bike, a kid was struck by a car in East Dayton. And we had police scanners in our cars. And so I heard the call and rushed over there. And the, the father was kneeling over the boy, yelling, and the emotion. Fortunately, the kid was not critically injured. Um, and I made some real nice pictures of this guy screaming. And then it was like, is this really news, or am I, and, or am I exploiting him? Or what are we going to do with these pictures? And... We talked about it back at the paper before we published them, and um, we decided we would use one of the least emotional photos because it wasn't, the kid wasn't killed, and it was a news story, but let's don't make it more than it really should be. And what bothered me worse was the fact I said, you know, now I've got a kid, and she's going to be riding a bike pretty soon, and if she got hit by a car, and I'm there, and then some guy shows up with a camera, I'm going to be kind of frustrated by that. Well, he was not, he, he never said a word to me, <coughs> but I just felt really awkward about it. And then there was another situation with a house fire where Mark Duncan and I both photographed this distraught woman, and we later learned that her child died in the fire, and we published that photo. And in hindsight, I think that we probably shouldn't have because we didn't know the child was dead when we ran the photo. And then it turned out this was when there were two newspapers in Dayton, and we published a late edition. The Dayton Daily News published an afternoon edition, and we published one that went to press at 12 o'clock and was only delivered in downtown Dayton. And we got the picture in the final edition and then later learned that the child had died. And that was – we didn't feel good about that. So, yeah, there's uh, – there have been a couple of those like that.
uh, for the most part. As you get older, you change your attitudes too a little bit. Uh, you know, when I was 23, it was like I couldn't care less, man. I'll shoot everything there is, and, and the public needs to know everything's important. And as you mature, you change your, you realize you're not as smart as you think you are. <laughs>